So uh, now, I would really like to uh, first to welcome our today's speaker, and uh, she is none other than Professor Nasra Tasneem. We are really glad she is here with us today. I would just uh, like to briefly uh, go over her uh, introduction. Uh, she's a professor and mother of, uh, mother of child health unit 2 in uh, Shaheed Zulfikar Ali Bhutto Medical University, which is also called, which is previously called PIMS. She's serving as a professor right now there, and uh, her clinical duties are, you know, inpatient and outpatient both. Uh, she has uh, been working in this profession and has given some golden 25 plus in this uh, 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 this healthcare profession, uh, which includes uh, indoor duties, outpatient department, clinical duties, emergency work, and of course the academic responsibilities of training and supervising postgraduate trainees. So, uh, Dr. Saiba, I would really like to welcome you on today's session, and I really thank you for taking our time for today's presentation. And inshallah, our audience or our listeners will be able to learn from you. So, Madam. Over to you. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, thank you, Sushita. Uh, it's really uh, an honor for me to be here with you and um, address such an August gathering. Uh, I think this topic is um, uh, really, which you have chosen, is really uh, one of the, uh, I would say, challenging topic in a way that, uh, you know, uh, those who are sitting here, my colleagues, they would uh, uh, share with me. Uh, and they would agree with me that uh, uh, pelvic inflammatory disease is one of the very challenging condition and uh, one sometimes gets stuck how to go about it. So uh, I think uh, I would try to uh, uh, I mean, share my views as well. I have been part of uh, uh, a trial which was conducted uh, with NACB regarding Nashiria the Nodi resistance in Pakistan. And I was just uh, sharing a few minutes ago that uh, that uh, trial was uh, that was a new project we conducted, and we found that uh, you know the, the antibiotics which we are giving are not the one which uh, that Nigeria Gnori is uh, sensitive to. So based on that um, trial, Nigeria Gnori is in Pakistan. Uh, based on that, the guidelines were changed. So um, I think uh, with this uh, additional information, I would like to go further. Uh, how to go, what is actually pelvic inflammatory disease? So, pelvic inflammatory disease is not a, a, an inflammation or infection of the lower genital tract, it's the infection of the upper genital tract that we have to understand. So, it may present in different forms in the form of the infection of the uterus, which we call as endometritis, it may go further deeper to cause myovitritis, then if it affects the Philippine tooth, it would cause selfitis and then it should go to the ovaries uh, because it's a continuum of process which goes on if it is not treated. Then it would lead to nephritis and peritonitis if it goes to the extent of the pelvis, the disease is severe enough to cause peritonitis. And then if it is the, the body's defense tries to localize it, it will become a tube ovarian abscess. So all forms of presentations are there, the patient may present in different stages in different forms. So, uh, cervicitis is actually to start with the infection is in the cervix and it causes cervicitis, but then it ultimately goes up and up and up. So, uh, these infections are, majority of the cases, they are ascending infections spread from the lower genital tract, or sometimes they can, that can be blood borne, or sometimes it, that it can be from the adjacent structure, for example, appendix. If there is an appendix, appendicitis, then the patient may have. Uh, the, the infection spreading to the child organ. So, uh, but when we talk about the ascending infection in majority of the cases, it is the sexually transmitted diseases, and that is why whenever we think of these, these infections, we have to think of the partner as well, because in the majority of the cases, it is ascending infection, and in those ascending infection, in the majority of the cases, it is sexually transmitted. So when we look at the annual incidence of, uh, you know, according to WHO, which is 9 to 14 cases per thousand fertile couple, is a huge number. And uh, when we go further, uh, in, in a subset of population of 15 to 34 years old, 
uh, is almost the incidence is 80 to 20 per thousand. So uh, again, a huge number. So we have all the time think of that she might not be suffering from that inflammatory disease when she would present with symptoms such as tuba pad. 85% uh, of these infections are, in there, as I said, is a sexually active female and uh, is because it's a sexually transmitted. And 15% results from the other procedures um, which uh, may include the kind of eyes, it may include curatide, hysterical angiography, and uh, sometimes they take lots of conception and they are removed. We, as we go along, we learn more and more about it. Now, two thirds of these infections are restricted to women of less than 25 years and the remaining one third are among 30 years or older. So, younger women having a more sensitive epithelium, they are more likely to have it, and especially early marriages. They are one of the practices in Pakistan, which leads to early sexual contact when the epithelium is still not mature enough to, to take up uh, this, uh, to, to have a resistance against this infection. So, positive agents, as since majority are sexually transmitted, so the most common positive agent is gonorrhea, Neisseria, gonorrhea, and chlamydia, trichomatis. They are the two most common agents which are responsible for the majority of the infection. Then, this is followed by other. Organisms like mycoplasma, urea plasma, lepticum, bladmella, streptococcus pyogenes, which leads to pyogenic kind of infection. And the pyogenic kind of infection would result from the streptococcus, strepto, streptococcus, E. coli, and all the whole list of these organisms may be responsible. Uh, in Pakistan, we have to think of that in the developing country, we have the mycobacterium tuberculosis also, which may lead to these infections, pandemic-related diseases. So, the other positive agents are anaerobic infections sometimes, like Papistraptococcus, Trotin, Corsidum, Bifermentus, and Fusobacterium species. And also, there are some viruses like Hepatitis virus, Pico virus, and Coxsackie B virus. Sometimes they also have been labeled as positive and inflammatory diseases. But again, reminding ourselves again that Nicerea gonorrhea and um, Clematitis, they are the commonest. For uh, they are risk factors, and when we talk about the risk factors, the majority since they are sexually transmitted, so we have to think about the risk factors related to sexual uh, issues, and that is early menarche, uh, early age at the first intercourse, multiple sexual partners, absence of contraceptive pills use, and uh, by the contraceptive pills, they lead to change in the cervical mucus, so cervical mucus gets taken. Chances of sending infections are reduced. The people who are using the core IUCD users, the IUCD works as a bridge between the vagina and the uterus. And, uh, uh, but that does not mean that the IUCD is, should not be used as a first time treatment, first time preventive uh, measures for the contraceptive purposes, uh, but then we have to look into that patient is not suffering STI, and STI is one of the contraindications for the use of IUCD, uh, uh, but we we'll come to it later as well regarding uh, you know, which kind of IUCD might some distance. Now, uh, other areas are where you know there is high prevalence of sexually transmitted diseases. So there are some areas in the world where the sexual transmitted infections are very high, and similarly even in Pakistan, when we talk about, we have to think about about where the patient belongs to. Uh, so uh, they are. Uh, like um, uh, commercial sex uh, workers, they are the ones who are very much liable to have these kind of infections. Then, um, hysterical angiography, uh, these are some interventions like uh, instrumentation to the uterus, which can lead to infection, and these are, as we talked earlier, hysterical angiography, manual removal of placenta, sometimes evacuation of decayed products of conception, and uh, sometimes. Uh, 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 the spread of infection can result from the appendicitis from the surrounding structures. And similarly, sometimes blood borne infection can also result, and that is from tuberculosis, which is a blood borne, and sometimes tuberculosis can be sending as well. Now, symptoms are uh, very interesting to note is that majority that there are some who would never present with any symptoms. Maybe the symptoms are very mild, which never came to the notice. And the infection went on, and that is why uh, infertility, uh, one of the leading result of this infection is infertility. And patient does not have any symptom earlier on, but uh, uh, 
uh, that she is infertile and the underlying cause is an inflammatory disease. Uh, but then there are many who present the symptoms. The most important, the most common symptom is lower abdominal pain. This is one of the characteristic symptoms which is present. Uh, she may have other associated uh, symptoms that is fever, dyspnea. She may have chronic pain, pain. Um, and then she may have uh, abnormal vaginal bleeding, especially post-faulty bleeding, sometimes intermenstrual bleeding because of the, the congested uh, pelvis. They may have the intermenstrual bleeding, especially when the cervicitis is there. They may have because of the congested pelvis. They may present with menorrhagia. And uh, then uh, there's abnormal vaginal cervical discharge, which is often correlated. Uh, then this urea, because uh, the women have got very short urea, so the infection can go from the lower area, from the pineal area to the to the through the urethra to the bladder to cause cystitis, and that leads to this urea. Uh, when we come to the signs, the temperature of these women may be elevated, may not. But uh, then it is, uh, if it is elevated, all the more strengthening the diagnosis of pelvic inflammatory disease in a woman who has been presenting with a pain in the lower abdomen. Uh, on a abdominal palpation, we'll find that she's, she's tender in the lower abdomen and she's tender in both uh, the uh, quadrants, lower quadrants. So uh, think of that she might be suffering from pelvic inflammatory disease. Then on vaginal examination, we find that especially the perspectral examination is very important in these women to see the kind of discharge. <clears throat> the, 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 there will be a discharge which is uh, which would be pearl discharge, yellowish white discharge, milky kind of a discharge coming out from the uh, from the cervix. Uh, they have got congested external uterine meatus and there may be concomitant parturic abscess. So speculum examination has to be done to show the discharge coming from the cervical canal. And then when we do a bimanual examination, we find there's a bilateral tenderness on the on the palpation of the phonesis. And uh, the, when we move the cervix, the patient's pain gets aggravated. We call it a cervical excitation test. So cervical excitation is positive. In addition to that, there may be a mass palpable to the phonesis. So 90% uh, of the cases, the information is revealed through a detailed history and detailed examination. And when we go into the background of the sexual history, you will find a lot more information. Husband might be, <clears throat> his profession is very important. His uh, frequent visit uh, uh, to foreign is very important. His job is also very important, which may, because people do not really commit the, the sexual history detail, but then, you know, there are some indirect questions through which you can get an idea for a woman who's presenting with the chronic pelvic pain. So, uh, the examination is showing you, you, you even sometimes patients are painful on the superficial palpation, but on deep palpation, you find that they are, the abdomen is rigid, it is tender in the lower abdomen. And uh, specular examination, as we talked earlier, that there is a, the, there is a mucopurulent discharge. The purulent discharge is something which is important. And by manual examination, the, 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 the tenderness in the furnace is and sometimes a tubovarian abscess may be found and cervical excitation is positive. So <clears throat> now it's uh, the disease is though uh, there are very important symptoms and signs, but still we have to keep other differentials in mind. And that is the topic pregnancy, sometimes ovarian accidents. Uh, she may have a torsion, she may have a, hem may have a hemorrhage of the ovary. So, so these are the important things which you have to look into. If she has got right-sided pain more, then think of appendicitis. And pelvic endometriosis, which as we are coming along day by day, is getting more and more common. So pelvic endometriosis has to be excluded. And irritable bowel syndrome sometimes. So bowel symptoms are important. Pelvic endometriosis, how can we differentiate from the from the, uh, the pelvic inflammatory disease is by a cyclical pain, which would be more towards in the, in the, in the, in during the menstruation, especially towards the end of menstruation, it would be getting aggravated and the aggravation would be going more and more. Uh, then uh, if uh, uh, we are taking, and this is, this is from the very beginning, we have been taught that you have to systematically, you have to exclude the system wise, you have to exclude the bubble symptom, you have to exclude the cystitis symptoms, so, so these are important to tell us whether the other causes may be 
chipping in. And uh, inflammatory bowel disease, like this is also one of the very important fact, uh, you know, uh, defensions. <clears throat> Similarly, UTI, as I said, cystitis may be there. And sometimes, sometimes, which is rare, and that is why it is last on the list, is psychosomatic sometimes, uh, you know, when you do not find, really find any other, you have given all kinds of antibiotics and still the pain is not settled. You have done all kinds of investigative workups, still it's not settled. Then, you know, you sometimes get a help of some uh, some psycho psychological glee. But uh, the important thing is that this is, uh, this is just for the sake of, you know, uh, differentials. But practically, I would say, think of organic cause and try to do as much as you can before leaving a woman that you are psych psychologically upset. So, <clears throat> so essential feature, if you're going back and summarizing this component, the essential feature of uh, features of pelvic inflammatory disease is lower abdominal pain, which is usually bilateral, and on examination, at natural tenderness and cervical excitation positive, that is cervical motion tenderness is there. So these are three very characteristic features of pelvic inflammatory disease and then there are certain supporting features which are, we have talked about earlier that is fever, deep dyspareunia, abnormal vaginal bleeding and abnormal cervical discharge and right upper quadrant pain sometimes because right upper quadrant pain and tenderness happens when the liver capsule is involved. So perihepatitis occurs, perihepatic uh, inflammation occurs and perihepatic inflammation I'll show a picture subsequently, uh, how does it uh, present. Then there may be a generalized peritonitis when the patient is tender, tender all over the abdomen. And this happens in cases of severe, severe acute pelvic inflammatory disease. So investigations, when we start talking about the investigation, all this start from the basic investigation. Full, full blood count does tell you C-reactive protein are higher. Full blood count shows high TLC count and high neutrophil counts. Uh, but in chlamydial infection, it is a lymphocyte count which is higher. In gonococcal especially, uh, it is the, in the, the neutrophils which are higher. Uh, a pregnancy test should be done to exclude the ectopic pregnancy because this is one of the very important differential and sometimes even you see the chronic ectopic pregnancies but when especially the patient presents with the acute symptom the, the the pregnancy test is the simplest thing to tell you a difference between the the pelvic inflammatory disease and the uh, the ectopic pregnancy then high vaginal and high endocervical swab Whenever you suspect there's a strong suspicion of pelvic inflammatory disease and you look at the discharge, it's this purulent discharge, you must take endocervical swab. But the swab uh, for the gonococcal infection and chlamydial infection, it is not a simple swab which we are doing. It is. It has to be a specific swab to be sent in the Stuart Power mediums or NAT test has to be done in these cases. And um, that is nuclear amplification, a nuclear amplification, a nucleic acid amplification test. And the idea behind is that we have to, if you're going for the gonococcal infection and you ask for simple microscopy and culture, you will not get anything out of it. So if you have to get a culture of the, for the gonococcus, the swab has to be sent in the steward power medium, otherwise it's of no use. And for that sake, you can collaborate with the laboratories, they will help you out. Then midstream specimen of urine to be sent for microscopy and culture. And again, this has to be done, done in the special culture medium. And other important thing for this culture is the culture has to be done within six hours. Otherwise, you do not find any uh, you know, such organisms because they're very sensitive uh, to the temperature and if there's a delay in the culture. Uh, serological test for syphilis should also be carried out whenever you suspect the node. Always exclude syphilis and HIV because the patient would be having multiple infections. And it should be done in both the parents, in, in both wife and the husband. Uh, get a transvaginal ultrasound. Uh, transvaginal ultrasound is actually, uh, uh, sometimes you may find something on the TBS. Otherwise, you may not find. And the, the, what you find, you may find is the tubo ovarian abscess. What you may find, find is the free fluid in the pelvic cavity, which may be present even in the mid cyclical phase. But in patients who have been presenting with this kind of symptom, a free fluid in the pelvic cavity is adds to your to, to your diagnosis. And then hydrocyclin sometimes you will find this standard. And many times uh, I do encounter these patients who are, who are presented with the hydrocyclin on the transvaginal ultrasound. And that gives me a picture where I'm standing now and how to 
the farmer. Then a uh, gold standard from the from the house shop level, the laparoscopy was considered as the gold standard. And here the dilated hyperemic tubes, inflammatory fibrinous exudates covering the tubes and fundus of the uterus and perihepatic adhesions, they are the ones. Perihepatic adhesions, and this is the picture of the perihepatic adhesions. Can you see this picture? This is Fitz of Curtis syndrome, which is called as perihepatic adhesions. So perihepatic adhesions, you know, because there there are these hepatitis, uh, uh, you know, not hepatitis actually, the inflammation of the capsule of the liver. So what happens is the liver capsule gets inflamed, and with the covering peritoneum, it forms this adhesion. And when we do a laparoscopy, uh, whenever you find the signs of uh, you know inflammation in the pelvis, you also find uh, you always take the laparoscope you know towards the liver, and you find out these adhesions. And this would signify typically in the chlamydial infections and sometimes mycoplasma infection. You will find these kind of adhesions, and that gives your diagnosis. Yes, this woman is a case of pelvic inflammatory disease. So, summarizing uh, again, minimum criteria is sorry, minimum criteria is adnexal tenderness, cervical motion tenderness, uterine tenderness. In addition to in a patient who is presenting with pelvic pain, and additional criteria again, we are you know emphasizing on it again and again. Why? Because these majority of the cases before putting them on the laparoscope, it's important that you look into these things. And then when you look at the additional features, then there are oral temperature more than 101 degree Fahrenheit, that is more than 38.3 degree centigrade, abnormal mucopurlin discharge, and abundant number of WBCs on saline microscopy of vaginal fluid. This may be present, may not be present. And if it is present, it usually signifies that uh, this woman might be suffering from that. Elevated DSR, though raised in many other conditions, but in PID, you also expect this thing. And, and then CRP, although raised in other conditions as well, wherever the inflammation in the body is there, CRP would be raised, ESR would be raised, but in this specific woman, it is significant. Then, um, as we said, Nyseria gonorrhea, documentation of cervical infection with Nyseria gonorrhea and, and chlamydia trichomatis, that is the final solution. Uh, but the uh, important thing is that do we need to wait for this to treat the women that we'll be talking about in a little while. Definitive criteria, although endometrial sampling, which is histopathological evidence of endometritis is one of the ways where you have to go for the endometrial sampling, but shall we go for hysteroscopic? No. Hysteroscopy is going to to further spread the infection from the uterine cavity into the pelvic cavity, so don't go for this. So if somebody wants to confirm the endometritis, simple papal sampling, though it is not very much recommended, but histopathological diagnosis as a final diagnosis may be done through the papal sampling too, which we normally don't recommend. And it is, you know, there's a lot of data going on, information regarding this thing, but it is not really recommended. The transvaginal ultrasound gives add to information to a lot of extent, as we talked about earlier on. And then laparoscopy uh, findings consistent with the pelvic inflammatory disease, congested tubes, they are important, exuding the fluid, exuding, exuding from the mineral and the hydrosalpings on the on the laparoscopy. And as we said, the fritz culture syndrome where the perihepatic adhesions are found they are very characteristic of the pelvic inflammatory disease. Simple congested hyperemic tube should convey that the woman is suffering from the pelvic inflammatory disease. And then free fluid in the pelvic cavity in the laparoscope is another thing. Tubo ovarian abscess is another thing which gives you a diagnosis of the pelvic inflammatory disease. And one should always take the swabs from the uh, uh, from the from the fluke uh, from the ends of the fluid tubes and should send the way the Nyseria gonorrhea cultures and chlamydia cultures are sent. Chlamydia actually can be confirmed through NAT uh, nucleic acid amplification test. But for gonorrhea uh, confirmation, one should always either go for the repeat NAT or one should go for the culture. And as I said, culture should be in the specific uh, medium, right? that is through a problem medium. Uh, the laboratory people know about it and you can take it help from them. So now coming to the treatment, 
with all the differentials and with all the you know investigative workup uh, what are the principles of treatment the principle of treatment is to control the infection in the, in the anatomically why is it important if you are late you have literally lost the the the, the you know uh the patients uh, you have you have given a good arm to the patient actually because this uh, pid is associated with a lot of cpli which will come and number two is to prevent infertility and late cpli so the timely treatment energetic treatment is going to prevent her from the late cpli and that is late cpli is infertility uh, the chances of getting a topic pregnancy if the tube is not even totally blocked that she is a very high risk for the topic pregnancy and you all know when we look at the etiology of the topic pregnancy you always put the pid on the top of the list because this is one of the this causes endo selpingitis which leads to apparent you may not cause anything but leads to endo selpingitis and subsequently a dns in the fallopian tubes leading to development of the topic pregnancy Uh, initially, they don't conceive, and when they conceive, they they, they, they suffer from a problem, which is a big trauma for the patient. And the other third third challenge is the prevention of reinfection, and here the partner's role comes in too. So when the, we talk about the first component, and that is how to control the infection energetically, you have to look at the general measures as well, and then you have to look at the specific measures. So if the patient is in pain, must always relieve pain. That is very important. and then you uh, during that particular phase of the treatment they should avoid unprotected intercourse and then you have to do contact tracing because this woman is liable to have the infection so contact tracing is very important and um, how how do we know that the patient is responding if she was running fever or temperature would start setting down a pain would start setting down and the pelvic tenderness will start improving so from there you get that the treatment is working so antibiotic regimens um, uh, there are outpatient regimens and there are inpatient regimens so outpatient regimens are uh, uh, previously um, and when actually we started uh, the the study which i referred to uh, we started doing this study uh, because nyseria gonorrhea resistance was very common in pakistan because the tunolones were very commonly used every third patient was receiving cefloxacin and uh, the ciprofloxacin fluxacid so um, the resistance was getting very common and uh, it was decided by nscp to do to do that the find out the drug resistance pattern in to nyseria gonorrhea and what we found was that majority of the cases they were resistant to quinolones so uh, from there onward and they were more sensitive to uh, doxycycline and uh, they were more sensitive to the ceftriaxone uh, ceftriaxone uh, in third generation antibiotic so from there the syndromic management concept changed and the new regimens were based either in the on the doxycycline or ceftriaxone uh, adding to the doxycycline because when the patient comes to you you have to give the a shot of ceftriaxone or cefotaxim uh, and add on to that um, doxycycline uh plus they can be added to benesid one gram orally in a single dose instead of uh, cefotaxim you can give that and uh, or any other parenteral uh, third generation antibiotic can be used in uh, you know in addition to cefotaxim or ceftriaxone so any 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 third generation can be utilized as a single shot Well, followed by because you know that the patient is not going to take it for a long time so single shot of that to, to give a load of antibiotic and then adding on to that is the oral doxycycline 100 mg amount twice daily this is this gives an ideal uh, you know uh, coverage uh, giving it for 14 days uh but sometimes the patient may not respond to this treatment and we need hospital admission and when do we need hospital admission when the infection is severe she is really painful she is running high grade fever her discharge is pouring out this woman needs to be hospitalized and why to be hospitalized to give an injectable antibiotic and keep, to keep a watch on worsening of her condition then uh, you need a hospitalization when she is having an abscess or she is having generalized sepsis or inadequate response to oral treatment if she if she gives an inadequate response to oral treatment three days 
she's not settling down. She be, she's better off rather than continuing the same treatment you admit. And uh, severe pain, which is requiring strong analgesics, and uh, similarly, she has presenting with the, with the acute emergency, severe acute abdominal pain, and think she's in surgical emergency, and you can't really exclude by any possible means. You admit, you start injectable antibiotics, see the response, she's not settling down, and also evaluate simultaneously whether she has got any proper pregnancy or she's got the torsion of emergency. So all these things, while she's admitted, you are going to be a better judge at that time. And um, any patient who is uh, who cannot uh, take oral treatment, uh, there you are straight away you are going to put her on uh, injectable antibiotic, uh, admitting in the hospital. So inpatient treatment again, majority of the treatment uh, they do include the doxycycline, 100 milligram every 12 hours plus cefotaxime. 2 gram IV every 6 hours. Uh, doxycycline gives a very good coverage to chlamydia trichomatis. And chlamydia is responsible in many of the cases. So it's very important that doxycycline should be a part of these treatments. And uh, third generation antibiotic gives a very good coverage to gonorrhea so that they should be part of the treatment. And uh, they can be given, uh, you know, depending upon your use of cefotaxin, 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 you have to give two grams, while if you're using uh, ceftriaxone, then one gram is uh, enough. Uh, you have to give uh, every, uh, you know, twice daily for at least four days and at least 24 to 48 hours after patient treatment. Now, this is very important. For how long, you know, a common question arises, for how long a treatment should be continued? At least 48 hours after the improvement of the symptom. That's very, very important. And then oral treatment should be continued for at least 14 days in the form of, if you have chosen, the doxycycline for that purpose. When do we need to do a surgery? That is another question which arises, is uh, uh, when the patient would need a surgery. When she has got a general peritonitis, she's very sick, she's not responding to antibiotic, she has got a pelvic abscess, uh, which again is not starting in 48 hours, then you have to go for the, the, uh, the only, only way where the pelvic abscess is going to respond is the uh, incision and drainage of that abscess. So if the patient is not responding to antimicrobials within 48 to 72 uh, two hours, she is a candidate for the laparoscopic uh, or laparoscopy, whatever you want to choose. Since it's a era of laparoscopy, I think uh, you can do, uh, the, you know, do manage with the laparoscopy. Uh, plus, a laparoscopy gives you a lot of added information uh, related to pelvic primitive disease. But uh, sometimes, you know, those who are not really good at laparoscopy, or sometimes if you feel that the patient has got previous multiple surgeries and she's not a good candidate for laparoscopy, then laparoscopy may have to be done. So, conservative versus radical surgery, that is, uh, this approach is a uh, debatable approach. Uh, where, uh, you know, bilateral setting of uh, with uh, hysterectomy is the answer, actually. Uh, why? Because if you leave a single, uh, you know, uh, organ behind, you leave one ovary behind, she's going to get her symptom persisted. Uh, if you remove uh, one, two behind, she's going to have a symptom persisted. So ideally, it should be. But if the woman is young, then you are you are bound, uh, you know, with the uh, you know you can't really remove her system. So if a, she has completed her family, she's uh, you know quite an aged woman. Then you can you know go for the uh, and she's completed her family. You can go for the removal of the system. So conservative surgery obviously would be chosen in the young women and those who are desiring. Fertility. So incision drainage sometime, sometime removal of the of the of the uh, wall of the abscess, or sometime the whole uh, you know we encountered uh, you know a patient where we had to open her three times. You know repeatedly she would present with the pelvic abscess, and we would do the conservative surgery. Ultimately we had to remove the system. So she had such a bad pelvic uh, infection, and uh, because the in this case even if you treat the partner, but her residual disease is there. And after some time, she comes up again to me for, and uh, she was open third time because she was young. We were trying to spare the things, but still we could not manage. Then uh, follow-up of these patients is uh, important, and uh, you have to follow them up in four weeks' time. Why? 
to see whether they have got the adequate clinical response uh, because sometimes slow infections continues and uh, the slow infection is worse than acute infection in a way those long term sequelae are there. Uh, then you have to make sure that she she uh, she was compliant with oral antibiotic. You have to make sure that she was compliant with it. If she has not been compliant, then go back some other remedies that is through admission, give her injectable antibiotic, and do something some other things. Screening and treatment of sexual contact is very important. Why? Because sexual contact she's going to have reinfection. So to prevent the reinfection, screening of the partner is very important, and not only screening but treatment is also important. And then we have to be aware that long-term sequelae of PID are there, but this does not mean that the patient who has already been through for trauma of this PID, acute PID, and now we, you know, scare her. But then she has to be warned that, uh, you know, in case uh, she runs into problem, she, uh, and for example, if she gets pregnant, she must confirm that uh, the pregnancy is intrauterine. So. Uh, but in a softer way because you can't scare the patient. That I always say that, you know, you can't tell the patient 101 complications at one go because uh, obviously she's a human being and already it's going through a lot of mental trauma. Uh, pregnancy test, if it was done, uh, if it is indicated, you must uh, get it done. And uh, then repeat testing for the Noria and Chlamydia after four weeks in those who have persistence of symptoms. Because if the symptoms are there, either Neisseria gonorrhea was resistant to that, or we gave an antibiotics, but she did not respond. Her symptoms are there. So probably it was a resistant strain which was not responding to that. So in that case, the culture would be an ideal thing to find out the resistance pattern. And uh, long term sequelae, we already talked about it. So um, uh, infertility and atopic pregnancy, these are on the top of the list. In addition to chronic pelvic pain, which she's going to suffer after acute PID. <laughs> Prevention is very, very important. And for that sake, uh, we must encourage safe sex practices. And uh, we also must encourage the barrier contraception, uh, especially those who have got a high risk partners. And in those cases, it's very important that barrier methods should be should be encouraged. Uh, health education is very, very important, which is not done in our country. And uh, we have, uh, we should have uh, some time for the sexual health, uh, uh, you know, education, and uh, which we don't have. I think it's the need of time. And uh, then uh, there is, a, it's very important that men do any procedures where the infection from the cervix can go up into the uterine cavity and into the pelvic organs, it's very important that you ensure that they do not, they are not suffering from the pelvic infection already, pelvic inflammatory disease already. Because here, you know, if the infection is there and you have done, for example, uh, you have uh, placed an IUCD, then the chances are there that this IUCD is going to, you know, aggravate the infection. Similarly, if somebody has got low genital tract infection, the persistent discharge, then again, think of that she might not be actually a case of, uh, you know, pelvic inflammatory disease at the early stage. So again, you have to make sure that you do not introduce the infection from the lower genital tract to the upper genital tract, any biogenic infection or any sexually transmitted infection from lower genital tract to the upper genital tract. And if it is already there in the upper genital tract, you do not spread it any further. So, uh, especially, uh, you know, we are very used to doing hysterosalpidography and uh, my colleague would, uh, you know, would agree with me many times, their pain that starts getting aggravated, which was not there earlier on. And the reason being that that infection from the fallopian tooth now has gone into the pelvic cavity. So, uh, it's very important that when whenever you order for these kind of uh, treatments, uh, IUI is these days very common, where the cervical mucus is being bypassed. So, I think there again, it is very important that uh, those who are doing IUI, uh, the, the sample is prepared from a very reliable lab. Otherwise, the chances of uh, infection from the lower area to the upper area would automatically you know, go in. And because cervical mucus was working as a, as a very strong agent for preventing the infection to go in. And that is why uh, a simple, and as, as I said, I, I would 
discuss this uh, the, uh, you know, towards the end, and this is where I'm discussing it, that intrauterine contraceptive device in the form of multi-load or copper T, uh, it is not preferred in the women who have got the pelvic infection. But uh, Myrina and uh, uh, other components, uh, where, which are the progesterone-containing uh, devices, they, by thickening of the cervical mucus, uh, sometimes they may be an option in women where other contraceptive uh, measures like, uh, you know, uh, not plant, they cannot be implemented and the pregnancy is a major risk they one can think of after treating the infection. Similarly, when you have placed in an IUCD, you must ensure that the, the previous infection is treated and it does not come into play again. And if you find that uh, the infection is there, you treat it and give her other options rather than insisting on that kind of uh, an intrauterine device. So with this, um, I would like to end and thank you for the patience listening. If there are any questions, I would like to welcome. And uh, I think this is a subject where there's a lot of uh, queries which may come up. Thank you so much for this uh, opportunity which has been given to me by Pfizer. And thank you for this. Uh, that's uh, really an honor for me. And uh, thanks, Raisa, uh, for uh, uh, for for this. Uh, sorry, and uh, for this uh, very very important um, uh, support which you have given to me. Sorry for the delay because. Uh, you know, the support was not there. Uh, the, the I mean, uh, had it not been there, I would not have been conducted this session because oh. it's uh, you know, saying the online session is easy, but actually getting it's very difficult. So thanks a lot for taking so much pain. And uh, any more, any questions from your side? I I I thank you. Yes, yes, Madam, uh, first of all, though, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and uh, secondly, I would request. Uh, uh, the BT team to please escalate all the participants uh, to the panelist level uh, so that uh, if there is any question, uh, now every uh, participant is escalated to the level of uh, the uh, panelists. So uh, if there is any question, uh, Madam uh, Baral, uh, a question, first of all, uh, there's a question from Dr. Nadia Iqbal. So I'm going to ask this question. Uh, she's asking after medication start, when it is safe to do the sexual activity, is there any specific precaution patient need uh, to take for this uh, sexual intercourse? Uh, thank you very much, Nadia. This is a very uh, relevant question and uh, many patients, they do ask this question and to restart the resumed activity. Uh, the, once the patient is uh, asymptomatic, she can resume the activity, but it's very important that barrier contraception should be used. So, uh, since she's already in pain, and the pain may get aggravated. So, it's better that once she's undergone treatment, uh, two weeks' time, if it is possible, to avoid the sexual co contact. But uh, if it is not really possible, then it is uh, she, she should be using the bedroom contraception. And even after that, un until and unless the partner has been fully evaluated and has also undergone treatment, they should not be... Uh, they, they, they should be uh, using the barrier contraception. That is very, very important. Thank you, very much, Madam. Uh, I hope uh, uh, the query is uh, answered. Uh, if there is any, any other question, I would uh, request all the uh, participants to please use both these uh, mediums to ask the question. Uh, yes, the floor is open now. No. I am Dr. Arif Masood. I want to ask a question. Please go ahead, doctor. Yes, I want to ask to Madam that uh, uh, the young ladies of childbearing, especially with diabetes, we have many cases and especially obese, they come with these things. As a physician, uh, we cannot do vaginal examination, cannot get swab and that. We have ultrasound, CBC, CRP, and the clinical symptoms so and then we treat and in many cases the coexisting uti is very resistant to many antibiotics so what do you suggest and uh, uh, as a gunshot therapy and my second question is is there any role of clindamycin and flagell in these cases 
and most yeah. of the time the fungal infection coexist and uh, combination of therapies should be advised uh th thank you very much there are many interlinked questions and uh, i think uh, a very um, genuine questions actually uh now, now we let's, let's start with the your last uh, question first and that is the uh, the, the women coming with the fungal infection uh, fungal infection is a low genital tract infection so we do not take it as a part of the pelvic inflammatory disease this is not a pelvic infection it is a local genital uh, low genital tract infection which can be treated with one drug or sometimes multiple regimens if they are resistant organisms so at the moment we will take the fungal infection away otherwise you know every third woman is coming with fungal infection and they would they would be labeled as pelvic inflammatory disease pelvic inflammatory disease is truly restricted to the upper genital tract infection from starting from the upper cervix to the to the to the fallopian to, to the peritoneum so so the the low genital tract infection yes the low genital tract infection actually becomes the hub of the start of infection so the gonococcal infection would start at the vagina gonococcal start infection would start at the urethra and then it will go up so the the starting point is the lower genital tract going up into the upper genital tract so uh, 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 coming to the pregnant women majority of the pregnant women um, it's very interesting and very important and relevant uh, the pregnancy is not uh, pid is not really very common in the pregnant because uh, the pe the pelvic infection usually does not let them get pregnant and that is a big challenge but if they are pregnant and their the persistent pain is there in those women the safe antibiotics should be given and uh, you already highlighted clindamycin it is as and um, third generation uh, like cephalosporins they are absolutely safe in these women and it should be take it should be treated accordingly this especially happens when when a pregnant woman conceives with an intrauterine contraceptive device the, the uh, she was using a contraceptive device and suddenly she got she gets pregnant and then she starts having symptoms of pelvic inflammatory disease she's painful and lot of abdominal discomfort is there whenever you see that the woman has conceived when she was using an intrauterine device before it is too late just refer her to a uh, to any nearby uh, gynecologist who should look at the thread of the intrauterine device if it is there like she is 6 weeks pregnant she has reported you being her primary uh, treating person uh, she can report to you that she is she is pregnant and she was using an intrauterine device then the best thing is to remove the iucd if the thread is visible if that is not visible then you can't do anything about it uh, and then she is also not at a risk of getting an infection if the thread is not visible so leave the the iucd in c2 to be removed at the time of delivery which would automatically be expelled but if the thread is visible the recommendation is that the iuc should be removed because that will now work as a uh, as a bridge between the uh, vagina to the uterus and pregnant women being more more vulnerable to infections they can get the infection if it was not already there so remove the iuc if you want to prevent the pregnancy i hope i have answered this uh, your question uh and not missed any part of uh, the continuum thank you very much madam uh, i think uh, uh, you have given uh, the complete answer if there is any other question uh, anyway madam it appears uh, uh, that your presentation is really marvelous bahut achhi thi and it is well understood so uh, there is no question coming up from the participants right now thank you so much uh, uh, i would still uh, say the take home uh, message is that uh, treat uh, these women diagnose these women keeping the pid on the top of the list whenever they present with abdominal pain lower abdominal pain secondly choose the best for them and uh, that is the third generation antibiotics which have been proven uh, that they are sensitive along with that doxy doxycycline as the oral component and then the other options like clindamycin as our colleague has highlighted and it is also one of the options which is given when the patient cannot uh, she is hypersensitive to any of the uh, uh, substances then clindamycin is a second option which has to be and the dose is 
900 milligram per day so that is also important that you give the right dose um, and uh, then uh, quinolone which were there earlier on but now all over the world the resistance pattern has now changed and quinolone uh, maybe some new one comes but so far the ones which are already there probably now we have to change the antibiotic pattern that is also, that is very very important to to keep in mind because uh, you know it is on the nip of the pen uh, just like on cipoxin ciprofloxacin you know is 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 so common that we have been doing and probably hamara jo common likhne hai na that has changed the the resistance pattern but now we have to come back to that old drugs which apparently looked very uh, you know uh, doxycycline which was looked like a very Mm, uh, uh, I would say a very common drug at that time, and then went out of scene when the quinolones came up. But that now is coming up again. So that is being shown through the various studies, various cultures which have been conducted in the in the formal studies. So uh, ceftriaxone luckily still carries its uh, role in the injectable form, and uh, uh, then oral if you have to give give this, or if you have to go to the clindamycin group. Then the injectable clindamycin followed by oral clindamycin. That is the second option which you can choose. And doxycycline are safe except in pregnancy. We have you have to think about. But uh, it's also important that doxycyclines are not uh, uh, you know uh, uh, they're not safe in pregnancy. But also the PID is also not very common in pregnancy unless somebody has been using intrauterine contraceptive device or she has got a constant history of PID which is still untreated. Thank you so much.